The 2015 Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. So today I'd like to uh, talk about a topic that I think affects nearly all language learners if they're traveling or if they visit or if they live in a foreign country. Um, I'm actually a native English speaker, a lot of people get confused about that. But it is actually my first language, uh, Irish-British. And today I'm going to talk about how to overcome the phenomenon of locals replying to you in English when you're in their country or in some sort of cultural context where their language is spoken and you've been really trying to learn it, but they just insist on, uh, or as a reflex, uh, speak to you in English all the time. And there are a lot of different strategies that can be um, used to overcome this, so I'm going to describe them at the end of the, of the presentation. So, a little bit about how widely spoken English is if you're uh, traveling. So, English is interesting. It's not actually spoken as a native language by a huge number of people, but it's become the international lingua franca in, for business, for tourism, um, for education in the last, I guess, 50 years. It's now, um, uh, it's now spoken by twice as many non-natives as natives. There you see the first issue, uh, native speakers are actually outnumbered quite dramatically. And it's vital, as I said, in certain sectors, so tourism, science, you can add many more to that. But especially tourism, I think, is relevant because if you're learning a language and you're not, still not very good at it, I mean, for me personally, I get very enthusiastic about visiting the country, getting into the culture. Um, so you're likely, in the beginning, then to meet people within the tourism industry, and of course they've all probably been uh, studying English for quite a while uh, in order to get that job. So that can be a little bit of a handicap when you're trying to use it. And of course, uh, in today's more globalized world, it's a major advantage for job prospects and economic enhancement. And that's also something, I think, very important for when you live in a foreign country. Uh, because local people also have an incentive to hang out with you for free English lessons. Especially if you're like me and it's your first language. And that's actually something that other people who've been foreign students, maybe on Erasmus or an exchange program to learn the language, told me when English is not their first language, uh, which is for me quite a little bit strange, but yeah, I guess just the opportunity to speak to maybe an Italian and use English is, a, is an incentive for them. Um, so yeah, as we all know, hanging out with anyone in a foreign language in some sort of cultural context, well, it's, it's like getting a free, free language class in effect. And I think Benny uh, Lewis said in one of his other articles or presentations about how expensive uh, English classes can be in some countries, and of course you're there, and uh, you're the free, uh, the free lesson that's just waiting to be tapped into. So, uh, English, the most studied language in, in the world. I actually came across this yesterday when I was traveling here, and someone sent it to me, and said, I think this will be interesting for your presentation. And it certainly is, look at that number. English uh, has studied 1.5 billion learners. What's the next best? Chinese, 30 million. It hardly even registers. French. French. Oh, French. French. oh, sorry. Wrong I forgot the French there. Um, they're going to be hated in Paris. The world. 80, 82 million. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually surprised Spanish is so low. Okay. And then German. Well done. Italian, Japanese. But you see, with the, the globes there, I mean, it's hardly even relevant compared to the global English learning market. Uh, language learning market. So. There you see just how many people in other countries are trying to learn, in my case, my native language. So the effects I want to look at first, um, for someone trying to learn uh, a foreign language and the locals just keep replying in, 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 in English. Um, the first, it could actually have some positives, right? And I'll deal with that, a little bit with that at the end, in a humorous fashion. Um, so it can be less communication, especially if you're just starting a language. I mean, I always mess things up thousands of times, right, before I get it right, as part of the learning process. And I say a lot of ridiculous things that get me laughed at. Um, so, you know, if you're somebody gets stressed on a holiday quite easily, maybe it's not so comfortable to have to try and speak uh, Danish in, in, when you show up in Copenhagen, it's a lot nicer. If they all speak to you in English and your holiday goes better, you just, you know, take an application from work and who needs the stress of having to speak and these community people will have your holiday messed up because you uh, weren't clear about what you wanted. But I think for most of us who are learning languages, we see it more in a negative fashion. And 
that's basically, I think the most important thing is the effects on a learner's confidence. Um, I think a lot of people here at this uh, conference may today speak, you know, five, 10, 20 languages, even more. But there was, all, there was a time when we only spoke, most of us, one language. And we had to learn our first foreign language. And like all new things, I don't think very many people have ultimate confidence in themselves when they have to test themselves and learn something that's a new challenge. And I've noticed this a lot um, in the last few years, now that I have the confidence myself, or even if uh, people reply to me in English, I don't get too stressed about it, but I see with people who maybe learn their first foreign language and how it destroys their confidence. They probably think about before they go to the bar what they're going to say, and as soon as the words come out of their mouth, bam, yeah, that'll be 250 please. <laughs> As opposed to, uh, I don't know, if you ask her if you're in French or something like that. Um, so I think that's the most important phenomenon uh, from a negative point of view. The other thing that affects everybody, whether you have the confidence or not, is uh, the native feedback. Um, maybe I said it correctly, maybe I said it wrong, I have no idea, because they just insist on speaking English. So I don't get to hear the, the native speakers, their speech patterns, uh, what they would have said. Um, uh, I think I remember once, I think I got mixed up when I was learning French between Toilette and Salle de Bain. And I asked for where the Toilette, I asked for where the Salle de Bain was in a restaurant. And uh, the guy said, well, actually, he replied in French. So I said, well, yeah, c'est chez moi, en fait. Vous voulez l'air, quoi? Vous voulez la Toilette? There you go. But if you hadn't said it, we'd say, yeah, the Toilette's over there. I would have kept saying Salle de Bain in every restaurant for until someone had mocked me like this guy did. So there you go, that's a good example that came to, came to mind just spontaneously now about how uh, getting that feedback is so important to learn and to progress in language. And finally, this is something I encounter a lot, and it's actually one of my pet peeves, is there's a lot of times a lot more mis miscommunication, especially if the level of English is not good in the country you're traveling to. And this happens to me a little bit if I stay in a hotel in, in Brazil. I'm just my own personal experience. Uh, where my level of Portuguese is quite advanced, but as soon as they see the passport come out, they just refuse. I mean, I guess the guy and the girls working there got the job based on speaking English. I don't really understand it. But they insist on speaking English. And the level is not super high, so I actually find it a real barrier to get what I want, because they just insist all the time uh, in trying to speak in English. So, um, as I said, at the end of the presentation, uh, I'll give you the best uh, strategies by the top polyglots because um, Ollie Richards um, coincidentally uh, pulled us all about two months ago. So he actually helped a lot in my presentation. So, why, going back to my last, why would you trust others to speak your language in the first place? I found this funny. Slip carefully. <laughs> Do we really want to stay this place? Really? <laughs> I actually tried, I thought this would be your way because this isn't it, no. It actually turns out to be Bulgaria. <laughs> So, I'll give you a little bit of my own personal background. I went to study in the Netherlands. And, you know, I arrived there and I actually had a course in English. I was going there really for the academics, not necessarily to learn Dutch as a language. Uh, but of course, being someone interested in languages, and already speaking a couple, I wanted to learn Dutch because I'm going to be there and to integrate and to really understand Dutch culture, it's pretty much essential to be able to uh, speak the language and understand it. And as soon as I arrive, I hear all these stories about how difficult Dutch is, the pronunciation, it's not worth your while because it's just so hard. I think uh, Claudia is smiling there. He had a similar thing in Finland and Lithuania. And the level of English amongst Dutch public is super high. It's one of the best countries. So the Dutch have a habit of, once they even suspect that you're a tourist or if you're a non-native speaker, uh, they're going to speak to you in English. Yeah? So this was a big challenge especially because I had never been exposed to Dutch. Um, and this was, I guess for me, maybe a little bit of a problem at the beginning because you know you think a little bit before you even order in the restaurant and then they're just like, you know, they just cut across you and then speak to you in English. So the solution I actually came up with um, amongst my friends who were um, primarily Latin American students who were two or three guys who were studying with me, is that we found a cafe and everybody suddenly, for some bizarre reason, spoke to us in Dutch in the cafe. They realized, because we were three or four foreign students, that we were really making an effort. And they didn't do what everyone else did. So we patronized this bar, not for the food, twice a week, but because the staff would actually speak to us in Dutch. And, you know, it's only a small amount of exposure in the beginning, but once you do these routines, 
you know, five, six, seven times. We spent five minutes chatting with the waiter or the, the guy behind the bar. Um, then you get a certain level of confidence. And when you go out next time to do other things, uh, you're able to uh, at least have the confidence to start. So I think this is very important um, for me because it was, um, you could also go just on the language exchange, right? But it's a little bit artificial, I was fine. You have to find the right person, maybe, yeah, you're not really super interested, but okay, I'm speaking Dutch. But here the people were generally happy to see us. It was very enjoyable, I was there with my friends, so it was really, I had a lot of emotion attached to uh, the experience of going there twice, twice, three times a week. And it really, I think it's what, three or four times actually. Okay, we're this. Um, so I really got into it and that really helped my Dutch because I don't think I would have learned it at all otherwise. I mean, we had classes, but I mean, that's like, um, um, let me see, that's a cue for, for Claudia to set up the next one. So other people have approached it a bit differently. I found the cafe and that, um, that worked for me. Um, <laughs> Claudio Santori here, he um, is from Vio Vio, which is a language learning. Okay, I'm going to that one. Hello. 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 And he's been living in, <laughs> he's been living in Lithuania and in Finland and been frustrated the same way because there the level of English is quite good and people don't even accept you want to learn their language. So frustrated, Claudio uh, made this very simple video with his, with his friend who believes he's Swedish and they complained about the fact that Lithuanians would not speak to Lithuanian, but they did the video in their in Lithuanian, but their level wasn't super good, but they really made an effort and they, as you can see, they just walk and they basically moan and complain. Right? <laughs> 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 they're, like, they're not like friendly guys. You know, they're, not like, they're, like, they're, like, you know, they're not hating on the Lithuanians, they're just frustrated, right? Um, so, next slide. So, an amazing thing happened. Uh, Claudia put the video up uh, online and it went viral in Lithuania, the video. It went so viral, I mean, I think these figures are stunning. Right? It got, what, how, how, it was 200,000 views in what time period? About 24 hours or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 24 hours in Lithuania. I mean, what's the population? About 1. <laughs> something million? <laughs> so, assuming that not too many other foreigners outside the country watched. I guess most people were actually Lithuanian. It's like, what, what did six Lithuanians <laughs> watch their video within 24 hours? So, um, Claudia's experience in the country, Claudia is, is living in Vilnius, um, went from the typical, and I, I think I've even read maybe on your blog or something, <laughs> complaining about it beforehand yeah, yeah. even. In English. In English, yeah, that was the difference. He complained in English on his blog. Uh, that he could never learn Lithuanian because people just wouldn't reply to Lithuanian. They would start every conversation, oh, you're so cute, basically, and I think I speak Lithuanian. You're and then, trying. Would, yeah, you're trying so well. They would say it in English. <laughs> <laughs> and he went from that to basically uh, a minor celebrity status in the country <laughs> where he cannot walk down the street without people coming over to speaking, <laughs> speaking to him in Lithuanian. <laughs> I think this is amazing. I mean, because it wasn't really a thought out like strategy, it was just something that really happened spontaneously. And now he, I mean, what, you know, how many times have you been on the television, radio? Um, See, you know, we're every week. Every week. <laughs> they have a really regular stuff. We have a small program. <laughs> In Lithuania. <laughs> Lithuania. <laughs> so it even shows you don't need a super, an amazing high level. And then just because of the um, buzz you've created about, you know, this, this phenomenon that you can then be invited and have this regular. Um, regular stuff and the doing stuff. So I love this story. I think it's a really good way. I'm not saying that everybody can do it and have the same effect. I think there's a lot of novelty involved, but um, it's something that I guess if you are frustrated, why not put it up? Maybe everyone in the university will see it. Maybe if you're living, so maybe everybody in your, I don't know, in your area will suddenly go, oh, that's the Danish guy who wants to learn Finnish or whatever it is, and they'll suddenly be enthused. Because I think once people see, and I probably also said this earlier, they see that you can speak in the language. Right? They watch the video, I mean, he, he, they speak for, maybe they only watch 30 seconds a minute, and they see you in the language, they say, okay, this is Claudio, and he speaks Lithuanian, rather than this is the Italian dude who comes to my cafe every morning, and he tries to speak Lithuanian, and of course he can't. So I think this is a big uh, effect. Um, and then this culminated in 
I forgot I um, have to check out the video because this didn't work. In a TEDx talk in Vilnius, where he described how to like hack random it. Random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, this worked perfectly on my laptop, uh, the train, <laughs> but it doesn't work, unfortunately, at the venue. Um, so you can go online later and tell um, me. <laughs> don't do the tennis thing. <laughs> so how does uh, the secret to hack the country and learn uh, language for free? Because that's the other thing. Uh, these this interaction with locals is really learning the language, and it's actually completely free. So you can watch the video. We don't seem to even have sound on the video, but I encourage you to go to the. I guess it's on the TEDx website. Yeah. yeah. Well, hack the country and learn the language yeah. for free. If you type those words in, you'll be able to find the later watch. I, I really like the present presentation the guys made in the, in Vilnius, and also you can go to Claudia's uh, own YouTube channel if you will. I get the original one if you want to watch what they actually said to get that kind of reaction. No. Windows. Okay. So I promised you the three most effective strategies. So Ali put out this poll amongst uh, a lot of the top polyglots, including people like Benny Lewis and Richard Simcott and Alex Rawlings and Luca and Pariam, everybody who'd expect. And um, I basically come across all three, and I actually pulled a lot of friends who uh, and what they thought. And they basically, there seems to be a consensus about these. So I kind of gave them all names. So the first one is the stubborn until prevail strategy. So you just ignore the fact that they reply to you in English or if it made your Italian or Croatia, for example, it's the same thing. Maybe it's fine with them. You just keep going until they give up. So it's kind of like about the wheels. <laughs> Maybe this will be a long process. And you'll have this bilingual conversation for 20 minutes. I don't know. But basically, you're just stubborn, right? And then it becomes this kind of psychological battle. I don't like this personally, but that's one of them. The other one is appreciate but insist strategy. So here, you can be very... Uh, positive and effusive in praising them and say, I appreciate your wonderful English, and I really like the fact that you went to the trouble of learning my native language. Um, but actually, I'm here in this country to learn your language because I'm really interested in the culture, the people, history, and um, I really appreciate if you reply to me in whatever language it is. So, say we're here in Berlin, so in German, because uh, it would really help me out. And I actually, I mean, a lot of times, um, People may even have moved country to learn the language, you know, and that's a huge left friends behind and made this all this effort and it would really, um, it would really be great if you could just help me with the language. In general, if people st still reply to you in English, then yeah, I guess if it's in a shop, you gotta just buy the stuff and leave. But if it's someone who's hanging out with you, then you say, okay, if they don't even respect you that much, you should question why they're even hanging out with you. So this is not a bad one. Uh, one that I've uh, it has comical. Effects is the denial of nationality strategy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, someone says, uh, I don't know, we can make it in, in, in Italy. So, so parlando in italiano, e poi, the, ah, hi, sir, uh, yeah, where are you from? Uh, and I said, so, <laughs> you're from America. Huh? Yeah, you're from, you're from America. From America. And, uh, no, in fact, you sono estonese, non so. <laughs> Purtroppo non parlo inglese, non ti capisco. Se, se lei parla bene estonese possiamo continuare a essere <laughs> estonese. So, um, I think, but I, I, what I, I think it was Richard uh, told me that he did this once, and I don't remember the language, maybe it was Richard, maybe it's Luca, maybe someone else. And the person, the country made up, the person actually was from the country. <laughs> and the person replied, I said, oh, excellent. <laughs> but Richard actually did speak the language, if it's Richard. I think it might have been Czech, and, or maybe it was Danish, and he was in Sweden, or I don't know, or something like this. But, uh, yeah, but uh, so maybe make up a nationality where you at least speak a little bit of the language. Don't say you're uh, Croatian and then you're like, you don't know anything in the language. So that would be good. Um, so my own personal approach, um, because I went through these two strategies based on what I've been told and gave them some nice names so you kind of get the cons uh, condensed uh, wisdom of our own experiences. But I like to just focus on, you know, communication and building genuine relationships with people in the different languages. I think over the long term, this is the most effective. 
Uh, we could, in the beginning, you're picking up a lot of technical stuff, learning how the words pronounced, uh, differences in pronunciation, obviously, and maybe grammar and getting an overall view and you know getting started. But I think in the long run, um, I start to focus on building real um, strong relationships with people who want to hang out, even if they spoke your own native language, is, is really important. So definitely, I avoid the people looking for free, free English classes. Right? And you can, all, you can recognize who these people are. They're not interested in you. They want to hang out. They insist on speaking English all the time. So, I mean, it's your own personal decision. Maybe you need that kind of attention and whatever to build your self esteem, but hopefully that's not the case. And you can just, like, not reply to the calls or the messages of these people. <laughs> um, <laughs> they get one shot, I guess. Um, but I actually don't insist on over. Uh, I don't over insist on using local language. That's why I can show up and the person replies to me English and I say, oh, you know, damn, well, I'm going to speak in whatever it happens to be. Um, because I'm here and it's all about me and you have to speak to me and say, we're in Brazil in, Portu in Portuguese uh, because I came to Brazil on holidays and I speak Portuguese and I'm great. Stop trying to speak in English. I think this is also a very disingenuous uh, attitude to have. And I mean, that's really you just looking for the free. Portuguese classes are what it happens to be. So if you don't want to be the free English teacher, I don't think more that you should ethnically try to be the free language student. So that's basically the way I try to try to deal with it. I don't get uh, upset or if people reply to me in English, um, unless it happens to be in a hotel or something. But, uh, uh, and I, if a person seems cool, yeah, maybe they want to speak sometimes English. What happens with most of my friends in the end is that we switch between languages. So sometimes we're speaking English. There's some people who speak perfect English only speak to me in French or Romanian because they just like the fact that I can speak it. And there's some people, even if I speak their language like German, they might speak to me in English all the time, most of the time. So I think in terms of the conflict, I, went, I, I start off the presentation about some of the negative consequences. And I think the confidence issue is more about if you are very relaxed and self sure yourself about the different languages, then you don't really care so much. They won't be able to undermine you. Even if I walk into a barn in France, and they suddenly bark back at me in English, pigeon English. Who cares? The guy is just a, a clown. So move on. And now that it affects you. So that's what I think is the, the, the crux. So I'd be interested to hear about your own experiences, um, especially if English is not actually your first language. Because this I find really interesting as a speaker, where maybe you don't even speak that good level of English, and maybe you're in Sweden and your Swedish is even better, but they insist because they have the perception that if you're foreign, you must. Um, have to be better in English than their than their than their language. And then maybe I have some other anecdotes I'll follow afterwards. So I'll open the floor. So I think I do this myself. Thank you very much. Uh, I had precisely the same problem in Holland when I came there. Of course it was for me easier to pretend I didn't speak English, but with the years, I've developed one, one second system which works always. If somebody starts to speak to me in English, I ask uh, in Dutch, speak to Netherlands? <laughs> <laughs> with, with a sort of astonished face. And in a certain way, they are a little picked and, 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 and no problem anymore. <laughs> I think I have a new strategy, and that's uh, humiliate the local. <laughs> I love it. I'm going to practice that later. <laughs> it's still kind of Dutch, okay. I'm not uh, English, I'm Danish. But uh, I try not to speak the local language before I can answer. When I have reached that, that's uh, uh, only one. And it's only only one, I continue 20 minutes until they keep up or we have done what we need to do and it doesn't bother me to have a bilingual discussion but there's an exception and that's people who are, who have a problem with English because they want uh, to express themselves and they do not do that them. Yeah, we do not undermine their self-esteem if you don't ask uh, or answer in English so those people I would ask I would have written. I would answer in English. Contrary to uh, the presentation here. Well, I think I, I handled that with the 
kind of uh, not over insisting part, but uh, in my own personal strategy. Of course, if someone is enthusiastic about speaking English and they seem like a cool person, I'm not going to insist on speaking their language all, all the time. I'm going to, of course, I'm going to reply in English. Uh, and I think that's something that maybe a lot of, having read a lot of other um, opinions online, uh, a lot of people are like, no, I only speak this language and are a little bit rude. Um, I don't think it's the way to go. Someone was also making the effort genuinely and they're not trying to undermine your confidence. I think definitely, I agree 100% should facilitate that. Even if you speak the, the local language better. And I always make, I mean, normally you can see people's eyes. It's usually what I do it on. People are enthusiastic and really look happy. I mean, why would I ruin their day and, you know, make them feel bad about themselves? So definitely, I think it's a good philosophy. Ich bin hier. Okay. Uh, ich sage, ich wohne hier in Berlin, ich muss Deutsch üben. Und 100 Prozent, ich kann Deutsch sprechen. Super. Ja, kein Problem in Berlin. Aber du hast, du hast keinen Akzent, glaube ich. Ja? ja keine Ahnung. Woher kommst du? Ich komme aus den USA. USA? Wow. <lacht> Super. Aber du hast keinen Akzent, so für mich, du bist äh, Deutscher. Ja, und ich glaube auch für die Deutsche, was... Äh, was sagen Sie? Na ja. Na ja. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, our, uh, Ursula is your name? Yeah. Ursula is from the United States, but actually she doesn't even have an accent in German. According to the German native speakers, that's not mine. And uh, we had a presentation already about sounding like a negative speaker. So maybe you should, maybe even if I'm partaking in that, that is, uh, that's very impressive. But um, that's cool. I think in Berlin, my experience, most people actually do reply to me in German. I don't think this is a city where it happens. It was more the Netherlands that I really felt that it was the case. I think also in different um, areas of the, of the city, if it's the tourist season, I don't necessarily frequent certain places. Okay. Uh, I had a question for you. That's right here next. I'm thinking about if there was a conference in Brazil and they were coming up with ways to make people speak English to them instead of Portuguese when they visit. I'm thinking about like if the roles are reversed. So the question is, with that in mind, what is it about these things do you think makes it work well? Like what's the successful factor that's preventing them from like winning the psychological battle? If they're trying to make you speak English, and you're trying to make them speak Portuguese in the example. You're talking about in the hotels where I have these uh, wars? <laughs> yeah, uh, or in some... other countries where you've been, like in uh, Germany or... The Netherlands. The Netherlands. On oh, the Netherlands, um, it doesn't happen so much anymore. That's the funny thing. I don't know if the society has changed or my Dutch is a hell lot better. But they, 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 they think that I think it's more my Dutch is better. I think they see there's a certain threshold. It happens a little bit at the train station, and I just speak back in Dutch. And normally, by the second time, they're like a bit surprised, and then they kind of give up. Um, in the hotels in Brazil, no, they're pretty insistent. It's kind of comical. It's like a two-way conversation, and I don't really understand them a lot of times. So. It's like, yeah, yeah, I don't want to, I wouldn't like to be rude there and say, listen, dude, you don't speak English well enough, please reply in Portuguese. But that would be the most effective way, because then, but that would probably hurt the guy's feelings, I guess, but it's kind of your own personal option. Yeah, maybe speak, reply a little bit in English, say, oh, that's cool, and then switch back to Portuguese, maybe they feel a bit better about themselves, so that, you know, they won't put up. I think that's probably the best way, uh, than getting in this confrontation and, yeah, yeah trying to win. Is it working? Yeah. Oh, well, that's so weird. I can't hear me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I, I find that what, what also helps just to add to, to this is that when um, when you have, or to what Ursula said, um, also when you have different friends, and you're going to have stubborn friends who are just like, no, I'm never going to speak you know, that language with you. We're always going to speak English. And when it's actually a relationship that you develop and not like strangers on the street, then you have a lot more control over it and you can negotiate. And, and then you can, you know, you'll, you'll notice really quickly, obviously, who's using you for, for free English courses. But I, a lot of people complain about that in Finland. They say, oh, apparently I'm just an English course. Like, but you choose to be one. You accept that label. So you can always say, like, no. And, and, then, and surround yourself with different kinds of people with whom you negotiate. So you can have a five-minute discussion in Dutch, and then you build your genuine relationship in English. And then you always, yeah, with friends, it's... It's a bit different than with strangers because you don't have that tension because you can talk it out, hopefully. Yeah, I, that's what I meant by, like, you know the people who want you for free yeah. language classes. And that's a personal decision whether you hang out with them or not. Maybe they're still cool and worthwhile hanging out with, even if you're a free 
tutor, or pre language teacher, but in general, I would say no. Um, so that's a personal decision. But that's that's also true. I mean, I did once have a relationship with someone who um, wanted to speak most of the time in English, um, and I didn't necessarily have a problem with that. But I also spoke her um, first two native languages, because two native languages, um, and it was a little bit of battle at time because. English is just a little bit better than my level in later two languages, but fortunately her, her, her mom didn't speak English, so whenever her mom was there, it was like, <laughs> which was a lot of the time, because she actually lived nearby. So it worked out eventually, you have to find a compromise, but it involved a lot of kind of negotiations in that, yeah. that sense. Yeah. Another slide? Um, I don't know, do we have any more questions? How much time do we have? Uh, one, one minute. One minute? <laughs> oh, I'm just going to tell some other But it's lunch, after, so maybe we have a little yeah. bit more. Okay. okay. I'll take one more question, maybe, or one or two, I don't know. I was going to tell some funny anecdotes about when I insisted on speaking the language. Okay. <laughs> this one is not going to make it look very good, but okay, I'll start with it. Um, so I had wanted to learn Spanish. And I had these, like, I were, these are, well, actually, I was living in the Netherlands. I had these friends, cool guys I was hanging out with, they were from Mexico, I think Bolivia. And we would go to the bar, and they would all speak in Spanish, like Connor. Vas a, vas a aprender español porque somos cinco amigos aquí y no vamos a hablar en inglés. So, we're not going to speak in English because there's five of us here, so you're going to learn Spanish eventually. So they use all these expressions in the bar, and then a couple of weeks later, I invited a Spanish girl out in the I guess on a formal day. I said, okay, let's go for a drink. I thought, okay, now I'm going to impress her. <laughs> so, I think a lot of people probably see the slide what I actually said. But. So I went to the bar and I said, okay, uh, we'll call her Mar Maria. Maria, ¿qué pasa chupar? <laughs> <laughs> because my friends, who are Mexican, uh, use this expression amongst friends, for guy friends. And it literally, what they want, what they want to express is, uh, like, what are you going to suck on? Like, what beer? Because they order bottles of beer. And it's a very common expression, I think, also I was told in Colombia. Unfortunately, in Spain, that doesn't have that meaning. <laughs> so they look out complete shock. First of all, I guess the fact that I said it in Spanish, <laughs> in our own native language, with like, what the hell is this freaky Irish dude asking? <laughs> who, who told you to say that? <laughs> so I had to explain that, uh, yeah, that was my, yeah, that I was trying to learn Spanish, but unfortunately I had not, not really understood the, what the, the word meant in over context. So it happens a lot that I order. You know, because I go to restaurants and maybe I can speak in English, maybe, but I try to communicate the language. My level isn't super high. I get stuff all the time. I didn't order. I, I talked about it last year in my presentation. I learned so many words in restaurants from ordering incorrect things. <laughs> and I'm like, what was that again? I don't want that. Next time. Okay. And this is actually one of my favorites because it happened recently to me in holidays. And I was with some Italian friends, and someone who was in the group who wasn't Italian uh, was a bit autistic. And I kept saying that he was un uh, autista because I didn't understand that uh, autistico is um, the, the word Italian for autistic and autista is someone who drives a car. <laughs> <laughs> the look of incomprehension because I said it at least 10 times we're like, but the guy is a computer programmer. <laughs> I just started thinking he's his chauffeur all the time. <laughs> and, um, Finally, I wrote it down, but... Um, um, yeah, in German, I think uh, Granada is a very attractive girl. Am I right about that? Are any Germans here? Granata. Granata, okay. I wrote it in Granata. That's, that's, that's the word for like old people. Like, I mean, I would really use that for. Okay. okay. <laughs> it's outdated, but uh, in English, it has completely opposite meaning. So I tried to use it once in German, and people just were offended. Yeah. Um, so that's another thing that happens when you're trying to. But I learned that. And now I even know I shouldn't even be using the word in the first place, it's not cool anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm not, uh, I stopped using. <laughs> I will, I will <laughs> teach you some modern version. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to this afternoon. <laughs> so I don't know if there's, we have time for any more questions. Uh, maybe one or one last one. I, I don't know who's doing the time here. Um, or do, who has a question, who has a comment? A funny anecdote yourself. There's uh, a guy at the front here. Okay. Um, my wife is Italian, and uh, I noticed that she doesn't have this problem in Germany with people switching to English because she has a really strong 
Uh, next, right? <laughs> so sometimes a possible fourth option for you could be um, trying to speak in German with a really strong accent from another language. Manchmal der auf Deutsch mit einem italienischen Akzent. Ich bin Italiener. Ich komme aus Roma. Well, that's interesting. I, I don't know. I can try it later and see what the reaction is. And if you the guys behind the bar, then I'll tell you and go, ah, ciao. You know? But that would be fun. I mean, it's, uh, it'd be cool if they were Italians. Um, I can see people are coming in. So. How much time do we have? Five minutes. Has anyone else got any more questions? Any more comments? Uh, well, there are a lot of people actually. I cannot actually. the video, but uh, somebody. It's yeah. power of the... Yeah, maybe if we take one last question out of that cloud, you'll close it up. Okay, so I have, a, I have actually a, an, uh, an opposite example. I was in uh, Sicily, I think, three years uh, three years back. I didn't speak a word Italian except for uh, your parlo un cazzo in italiano <laughs> at that time. And I ended up in some school and some teacher saw cigarettes somewhere. Uh, I, had, I had a bag of cigarettes. So she started like, like tell me a story in Italian. So, uh, at some point, I, I told her, uh, you know, Padre Italiano, and she got on fire. She just, uh, someone realized that I do speak Italian, and she ended up telling me the story of her life, about how her, how her, uh, her, uh, her, uh, her husband died, and how she used to smoke cigarettes and quit. So I think this, this somehow does not apply to, to, uh, to Italian. I don't know how, how your experiences are. Actually, so Italy was one of the few countries where I think hardly anyone ever replied in English. <laughs> um, yeah, Italians in general have always replied to me in Italian. I think it's the one country where I went to where they, they replied the least. Um, also, in, in, in Russia in general, people don't tend to reply in English so much. But I don't know if that's more to do with the level than anything else. So I'm going to learn. I'm going to hand uh, let Claudio speak about his phenomenal experience with the video. I want to tell one thing about uh, when I was in Lithuania, well, I'm still in Lithuania, I, I briefly learned Russian and Lithuanian for a month. And my Lithuanian friends that never spoke to me in Lithuania, they got so pissed that I was learning Russian in Lithuania, <laughs> that for a week they all actually, this was before this video, they started to speak to me in Lithuania. <laughs> so it was very interesting that it took me to switch to Russian to get them to talk to me in Lithuania <laughs> for the first time. And I think what I learned from my video experience is that it's very powerful when, when I ask somebody, do you speak Italian? And then they tell me like, oh yes, yes, I speak a little bit in English. But if they tell me in Italian, no, 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 you don't parlo Italiano. Now I think that they actually speak Italian because uh, it's very, just very powerful. So this video when we were just talking in Lithuania, really telling nothing like, you know, Asha su Claudio, Italas, prasho, kalbeki te su mumis lietuviški. You can learn this in 20 seconds, like really, it's just uh, nothing. But when you watch it, it's just so powerful, it's like the selfie, you know, if I take this, like, <laughs> the gathering, it's so much fun, you know, but if I take the, now the political gathering, it's not so much fun. So if I make a video for 20 seconds where I pretend that I speak a language, and even if you say, maybe it doesn't go viral, but maybe your friends can see this, maybe your university people, maybe your close friends, then they will unconsciously believe that, Wow, my friend speaks Dutch. And then they will talk to you in Dutch because now they believe that you speak Dutch and then you need to catch up with their belief. And now you, are ma you made yourself accountable on top of this because on the video you asked them to speak to you in Dutch and now you have the pressure, but the environment is very friendly now. So you're pressured to learn Dutch or German or Lithuanian or Italian. But now the environment also wants to talk to you. So that's the power of this uh, small video. It doesn't cost anything. You don't need to go on Bluetooth to do it. So it's <laughs> free. You need your phone and you do it. Like you don't, yeah. don't leave it with the microphone. <laughs> awesome. So I actually feel a little bit like that if I make a video in a foreign language where I'm learning it. That Because uh, a lot of people comment and say, oh, that's great, Connor. And they give me you know, tips. But then I feel like, yeah, I have to follow through because if I meet other people who have seen the video and I can't reply in the language, it's going to be a bit embarrassing. So uh, this public accountability is also, I think to a certain extent, uh, quite a, a useful useful thing. But the secret was not to use English at all. Yeah, that's like the, really not to say, sorry, excuse me, no excuses, it was just in the language. And I think also not having any excuses, even in the, the local language is good. I mean, you shouldn't be apologizing, my level is not so good.
you know, you should just say, I speak it, I'm learning it, I'm how's that, and I think people will respond to that in a very, yeah. Yeah, and we didn't really, and I, when you, I think you made a simple example about the friends in the coffee place. I think the key, it's very hard to go and talk with one girl on the street, it's easy if there's two girls. <laughs> so, depends on your... <laughs> it depends on the skills. Is it? So the fact that you were like three guys in the coffee place, it made it easier for a, a native to approach you because now it's not so awkward if you talk with a stranger, but there's two strangers for it. So the fact that it was me and my friend Wes, it made it easier for natives to... It's, you're not a stalker anymore. You're going to, <laughs> to like two friends that they ask for help. So I had the same experience in Lithuania with a Russian girl who was studying Lithuanian, and people were helping more than if I was alone. Because if I'm alone, now I'm stuck to talk. If you ask me something in Italian, and I help you now, I don't know if I'm going to help you for one hour. But if there's two of you, uh, I don't leave you alone. I'm like, you know, you have a friend. You can talk with your friend. So the friend element is also very powerful, I think. Okay. That's an interesting point. That means I can walk around on the continent. But you are skilled. You're alone. You're a skilled person, so you can use this. But if you're less skilled, it's harder to go to to one person. It's easier to talk to two people, a person, not just one. Okay. Even in the dating website, they have different strategies if it's just one girl. A group, it's easier to open than one girl. This is the tech. Uh, tech I refer to the experts uh, on the dating approaches. Okay, I, I think that's it. Uh, they're coming around the time. You can ask. Uh, I just have one thing to add about the being with your friend before, because if you're by, your, by yourself in the country, you look like someone is sitting here. But if you're in a group where there's two of you, you would look like a forest. And that's also a factor for like... Yeah, but if they're going to reply to you yeah. in the lip of our Great. See you all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.